great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, hello, everybody. I realize you can hear me. I can't hear you. So I look forward to hearing from you by, by other means. Um, I'm, um, as Arthur said, uh, both Paul and myself are involved in uh, our respective companies in delivering advanced analytics, uh, a lot of which is, is still good old statistics and, and marketing science, uh, as, as you've probably known it. Uh, sometimes today it even gets called data science. Uh, which is a whole other topic that we uh, we can talk about another day. Um, I'm going to look at um, three particular advanced analytical methods or topics, if you like. Um, they are um, key driver analysis, which you may know of already, um, and I, I, what I'm going to talk about is, is a refinement of the traditional, if you like, key drivers analysis. I'm then going to talk a little bit about mapping, uh, which again I think many people might know about, but I just want to sort of give our perspective on it. And then finally, I want to talk about decision trees, uh, which covers a, a variety of algorithms. Um, to start with key drivers, um, we um, I, I, I work predominantly with Cobalt Sky um, in, in uh, statistics and market research. And if we do a, a kind of an analysis of the the types of work that we, we perform for, for, for agencies and clients, key drivers is probably the winner. We probably do more of this than, than anything else. We do quite a lot of conjoint, um, which Paul's going to talk about, and a lot of segmentation. Uh, but sort of first among equals is probably key driver analysis. Um, just to give us uh, give a kind of summary of what that actually means, uh, and specifically, you know, thinking in the research context, usually we're trying to understand um, the drivers of interesting and valuable business outcomes. So, looking at things like customer satisfaction, NPS, Net Promoter Scores, purchase intention, recommendation, and so on. Um, statistically speaking, and I know many of you will have heard of this, uh, because key drivers is, is usually based around regression, which we'll come on to, we tend to describe the outcomes as, as the dependent variable. Um, and the inputs to the key drivers um, are usually things like um, other kind of rating attributes or measures, satisfaction measures and opinions. Um, and we describe those statistically as, as the independent variables. So what we're really trying to understand from a sort of delivery and business perspective is what's the relative importance of the drivers in influencing the, the outcome of interest. So if we can identify the, the, the strongest driver, um, then if we focus and improve on that driver, we have the maximum impact on the outcome, whether that outcome is uh, promotion, purchase, satisfaction, or, or something else. So let me take a very simple example. Now, in reality, we have more than four inputs or four uh, independent variables. But let's say we, we're working for an airline and we want to look at the, the drivers of overall satisfaction. And we have four rating scales um, as, as potential inputs to that uh, driver measurement. The basis of traditional way that we do key drivers is, is around correlation and regression. And what you'll find is that, that some analysts just use correlation, and, and, and that's you know, perfectly fine. Um, you know, often when we look at different statistical methods, which is, is, is largely what we'll talk about today, there are trade-offs. There's not necessarily a, a wrong or a right way to do it. You know, we, we, we need to sort of uh, assess the relative uh, efficacy of different approaches and, and, and what the different approaches actually mean. So if we were to look at a, a kind of correlation analysis of our four inputs, our four drivers, and our output, which is overall satisfaction, we might find that two of the drivers, two of the inputs, in this case onboard staff and food and drink, are more highly correlated with the target of overall satisfaction. So those are the green numbers there. You can see onboard staff correlates at 0.6, food and drink at 0.5. However, one thing to bear in mind here is that um, when we look at the correlation between those two drivers, that's also relatively high. Uh, so there's a high correlation between onboard staff and food and drink, and that's the red number at 0.8. Now, most analysts, almost uh, uh, marketing science, statisticians, and so on, in our experience, would, would present the key drivers back to the client or the agency through the, through the lens of regression. 
And when we turn this into a standard linear regression, we might see something like this. Um, the, 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 the approach underneath this is that we, we look at the beta coefficients um, in, in the standard regression and we just standardize them to, to add up to 100%. So we might find, as we saw in the correlation, that onboard staff is the strongest predictor. And in the traditional regression view, that may grab 50% of the, the importance. Food and drink, however, comes in third, which might be surprising given that it was originally quite highly correlated. Now the reason for this is because of that um, red 0.8 figure that we saw in the correlation table. That one of the pitfalls of, of, of running key drivers analysis, the traditional way using regression, is that we have this enemy which we call multicollinearity, which I've talked about down at the bottom here. And that's really, it sounds like a very technical statistical term, but it's about the correlation among the drivers. Um, and when we come to do a regression, um, it, it's, it's a, a, a sort of technique which tends to allocate the strongest, uh, the, the bulk of the correlation to the strongest driver or the strongest driver from the correlation perspective. So onboard staff, in a sense, is kind of hogging the limelight here, and perhaps unfairly so, because we know that um, if we improve food and drink, then we should also improve satisfaction. So the alternate part of, of, of this particular view of KDA is that there are then a number of different approaches which all build on the standard regression, the near regression or logistic regression way of producing key drivers, but actually make the adjustment to compensate for the, the issue that we just saw. Um, so there are three, there, there, there are more, but there are three probably primary approaches that, that uh, we take to this. The first one is, is relative weight analysis, which was formulated by Johnson, RWA. Um, I've included um, some links so that you can you can go back and look at um, the um, um, the originating originating document and publications around the uh, the various techniques. Um, the second one is Shapley value analysis, which has been around a little bit longer. Um, it even has its own wiki page. Um, and the third one is CCR, which is correlated component regression, uh, which was actually pioneered. Uh, by Jay Madison, who has his own sort of commercial venture, and you can buy CCR in a product called Core Express. Um, we tend to use, and this isn't to say that it's it's you know better or worse, but uh, we tend to use the Shapley approach because we find or we have found that it it gives um, satisfactory adjustments and satisfactory outcomes, um, and partly because we tend to use R quite a lot, and there is a package in R called LM. Um, which has Shapley value regression in it. So it's, it's standard linear regression with Shapley in it. Um, R, if, I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of it, is an open source statistical um, software package uh, available online um, using kind of public GNU licenses. Um, so it's um, the advantage is that it's free. The disadvantage, of course, is that it isn't uh, quality assured and tested. So we need to make sure that we cover that part when we, um, when we deliver to clients. And the Shapley view, um, the, if you want to think of it as the kind of adjusted regression view of the, the key drivers, tends to compensate for the problems of multicollinearity. Um, so in a, a, a Shapley view of the analysis we looked at, onboard staff is still the most important predictor, uh, the, the strongest driver, if you like. But food and drink kind of gets the credit that it deserves because it is, you know, as we can see from the correlation matrix, one of the key drivers. Um, so just to kind of wrap that up, um, there are, as, as with each of the techniques that we talk about here, pros and cons to using them. Um, from the perspective of using something like Shapley in, a, in addition to sort of standard regression approaches, we typically find that um, the, the results are more robust. So we, 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 because we're fixing for multicollinearity, uh, an issue which often creates a problem in standard regression is, is less of an issue when we, we use Shapley. Interestingly, that also means that when we, we discuss the results uh, with our clients, the results tend to be more intuitive. You don't have uh, potentially strong drivers disappearing. Uh, you don't run into some issues around negative uh, signs on drivers, which can sometimes happen with, um, with standard regression. On the downside, um, 
you know, I, whenever we deliver, you know, you often have to explain, you know, some of the intricacies of the approach so that it can sort of be validated and accepted. And this, I guess, adds a layer of complexity. Um, Many business users are familiar with regression, so standard KDAs are, you know, require little explanation. Um, when we introduce something like Shapley or RWA, you know, we do need to explain why we're doing it and, and, and what the additional uh, method actually brings. Uh, and I suppose the other side is um, th there isn't right now, um, with the exception of CCR, uh, we don't have um, nice user interfaces to, to, to run these uh, Shapley and, Kep and RWA regressions. So uh, we, we have to kind of write a bit of statistical code ourselves using R. So if you are somebody who can kind of crank VBA or R, then, uh, then you're in a good place as far as that goes. So the second topic I'm going to talk about is mapping. Now, you know, back to the work we do at Cobalt Sky, we, we, we typically um, see mapping as, as, as something that, that is not used as often as perhaps you know we think it could and should be. Um, and there are reasons for that that I'll, I'll come on and talk to. So in terms of our list of um, the typical analyses that we do, mapping is probably in fifth or sixth place. The, the general idea of mapping is that we, we produce a visualization effectively, a 2D plot usually, often with quadrants in it. Um, which shows underlying dimensions in the data. And those underlying dimensions come from statistical algorithms. And I've listed some of them in, in the uh, examples here. So we can produce maps from factor analysis, multidimensional scaling, discriminant correspondence, and others. Um, and the decision as to which technique you use to produce the maps is, is often driven by the, you know, the nature of the problem um, and the, the types of data that, that, that you're dealing with. Um, so let me give you two examples of different methods generating different maps. Um, the first one, um, I apologize for this because if anybody's looked at the mapping examples, this is this is a rather overshown example of uh, distances between U.S. cities. Um, I, I keep promising that I'll produce the, the same plot for um, European cities, and I, I, I certainly will soon. Um, but what we see here is we can see the um, matrix at the top which shows us the distances in data. So that's like a that's kind of data table of distances between the various locations. And then underneath we have a, um, a map that was produced in, a, in, um, in two dimensions using a technique called multidimensional scaling. Now the nice thing about multidimensional scaling, if the data fits it, is that the map is usually quite intuitive and interpretable. So you can see from here that this does actually approximate to where these cities would be on the uh, the real geographical map of of, uh, of the United States. Um, if you take a closer look, you'll see it's not quite as it should be, um, and the reason for that is that we don't, you know, we haven't got a full set of distances, a full set of cities, I should say. So the more data we add in here, the closer this map will be to the the true view of of uh, the major cities across North America. In the research context, um, we often end up producing maps from the standard cross tabulations that are kind of ubiquitous within market research. So in this particular example here, I'm looking at um, relationships between different airline brands and our original four attributes that we looked at when we're looking at the key drivers. So the beauty of a correspondence analysis is that it takes the sort of familiar tabular output that, that we see all the time and presents that visually. And we all know that visualizations are often a better way to communicate information and are just more intuitive. However, there is a catch. And I think the catch is one of the reasons that we don't always see correspondence as often as, or correspondence mapping as often as we might hope. And that catch is that unlike the multidimensional map that we just looked at previously, uh, we can't trust our eyes to the point where we can't trust the diagonal distances between the red and blue points. However, we can trust the horizontal distances and the vertical distances. And when we're um, presenting this information back, we tend to say, if you see a brand and an attribute in the same in the same quadrant, then you know there is an association between that brand and attribute. But the, the, the more precise way to read it is to look, for example, horizontally to start with. And we can see horizontally that onboard staff and check-in experience are 
more in the positive axis and food and drink and light entertainment are in the negative axis. So we might say this is more about service across the X, across the horizontal, and we might say that the vertical is more about product because that's where food and drink and light entertainment are. So we can see that this notional airline British United is closest to onboard staff. So in that service dimension, we might say they're performing well because we're, we're mapping high percentages of uh, agreement with the satisfaction with onboard staff here. However, the catch is you could say the same thing about Australian Hopper because in the horizontal direction, that's also close to onboard staff. So we have to look at this type of map, the, the map that comes from correspondence, with a more forensic eye perhaps than, than we would just like to off the page. Um, but nevertheless, I still think it's a powerful way of presenting you know, the, the, the thousands of cross tabs or the, the salient results from the thousands of cross tabs that we normally look at. In terms of pros and cons of mapping, um, the visual aspect is, is, is clearly a, a, a major bonus, a major um, advantage of doing it this way. Um, it's, it's good to communicate to, to business users as well because they're, they're familiar with quadrant charts. You know, as consultants, as, as I know many of us are, we, we, we like to present the quadrant charts in, in, in different ways. Um, the challenges are twofold, really. The primary um, obstacles are if we're using a, a correspondence map, which is quite common, we do need to get over that hurdle of the explanation that, that we just went through. And also, there can be some issues around preparing data to get the data in the right shape for the statistical algorithm that produces the map. So in our experience, those two things tend to, to, to sort of get in the way somewhat. But for many clients, you know, this is a very powerful way of presenting results. Um, and you know, many, many clients um, really buy into it and get very excited about it, quite rightly so. So I'm conscious of time. My, my final uh, and slightly shorter section is on decision trees. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of decision trees. We, we do a lot of data analysis, both inside and outside research, uh, and we do use decision trees a lot. Um, they are visual ways of, of, of looking at data again, um, but they do have some kind of statistical rigor built in, just like mapping does. Um, they can be used for prediction, segmentation, and also potentially for key driver analysis. So it's an alternative sometimes to, re to regression. Um, the methods that build decision trees, probably the one that we've heard of most usually in, in marketing science is CHAID, uh, but there are others, classification and regression trees, and, or CART, uh, C5 is, is, is another powerful technique, and, and so on. Um, incidentally, CHAID was invented by the chap Jane Magidson, who I mentioned back in the the key driver slide, who, who is the um, also the inventor of, of uh, CCR, coincidentally. Um, so in terms of what a decision tree looks like, here's back to our overall satisfaction example. Um, here is um, a, a tree where we're looking at, at the top of the tree, in the root node, we see the average overall satisfaction is 6.1, so we're on a, a rating scale between 1 and 10. Uh, the trees will look at the, the potential inputs and drivers that we present it, and it will put the strongest driver at the top of the tree. And, and once again, here we see that onboard staff is the strongest driver, and it does that through a kind of statistical process. It will then decide where do I then slice the scale of onboard staff to get the most significant differences in overall satisfaction. So you can see the node over on the right here has an overall satisfaction 9.1, and that's where the onboard staff rating was above nine, above eight, so it was nine or ten. And then that group breaks out um, further into food and drink. And if food and drink rating was um, three uh, above three, so four or above, then it, it jumps up to 9.6. Three and below, it it jumps up to it drops down to 5.8. So this again just gives us a very clear visual um, view of, first of all, the relative importance of drivers, but also how those drivers um, interact together. So what, statistically speaking, what we call interaction. So we can see there's a clear interaction between high scores of um, onboard uh, satisfaction, uh, satisfaction with, with the onboard staff and food and drink. If I just take that on one step, um, 
this also allows us not just to look at kind of attributes as drivers, but also potentially characteristics of the respondent or the customer, in this case the passenger, um, and the demographics and other information that we might have about them. So we might see from a demographic perspective that the strongest discriminator is which class the, the, the traveler happens to be in. Business class is rating 9.5 against the overall, overall average of 6.1, which we might expect. Economy class is 4.3. Within economy, for, 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 for reasons we might investigate further, there's a significant difference between males and females. Females tend to be even less satisfied at 3.8. And then the females themselves may break out um, into um, different age ranges and again the statistically significant age ranges are kind of discovered by the tree and we might find in the end we end up with effectively a segment of dissatisfaction and in this case it is female travelers in economy class who are over 45. So just my final slide uh, is to say with decision trees there are pros and cons um, they have a similar pro in the sense that they're kind of visual and somewhat easy to understand um, we we tend to find that business users get decision trees that you know there might be a, a kind of an orientation step you need to go through just to explain what the different numbers mean but you know once they get it they get it uh, from a, a kind of um, ob ob obstacle perspective um, the cons are uh, with survey data you know if we're primary researching and we've got 2,000 or less uh, records then as we slice down the tree the base starts to diminish quite quickly, so you know we need to be careful not to, to, to end up in in low bases. Um, e even if we have statistical significance, we don't necessarily want to have the bases that are too low. Um, sometimes trees can get quite large and, and, and they're difficult to present, um, and they are somewhat less familiar than regression. So if you go right back to the beginning of key drivers, as I was describing it, then um, you know if you're working with regression, generally you're in safe safe hands because business users. Kind of tend to understand what regression is about, so sometimes you have to to go over that hurdles just to explain what decision trees are doing. Um, but I think, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, um, if anybody is interested in this whole area of predictive analytics, our observation has been that decision trees are the predominant algorithm that gets used. Uh, logistic regression probably, or regression is probably a, a close second, but um, you know they they do have a sort of general acceptance in the the business community. Um, so that that's um, that, that that's my part. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll hand back to Arthur, and I hope, hope to hear some questions and, and speak to you later. Thank you.